the size of the CAD model you've produced and the size of the stock that we're going to buy to produce your CAD model generally are not the same. We almost always want more stock than their CAD model has, or than CAD model size to, and with, the, with a few exceptions which we'll go over. Um, why we want more stock? Uh, most of it has to deal with the quality of the stock, but some of it has to deal with how we want to hold on to the part to make it. So uh, if we look at a lot of different stocks, um, not only is it under nominal generally, to the point where a lot of standard tolerancing, it's going to be out of tolerance already for a nominal size. But if we look at some of the edges, um, this was round bar rolled into rectangle. It's not very rectangular. Uh, and on top of that, it's got a very coarse kind of porous finish. So that's never going to make uh, a very nice looking part. Uh, and the surface finish isn't going to be uh, usable in a lot of applications. Um, and so in order to make a 3 8 by 1 inch stainless part, we're going to have to go up to half by inch and a quarter stainless steel. Uh, looking at this brass, any extruded product or aluminum, red metals, um, generally this is copper. There's going to be some scratch marks from the drawing. It's going to have a nice healthy corner radius. Um, and it's going to be undersized. Uh, and the common problem with this brass is it gets pulled through a series of like drawing dies and straightening dies. You can see this little divot on the end. That's where the gripper held on to it. You can see the impression it left in the bar. So we couldn't make a three eight, a three quarter inch thick part out of this if we wanted to because of that huge divot left just from the process of making the material. None of this is too big of a problem though because our preferred approach for making parts in a machine shop uh, on a mill is what's called a grip stock technique where we're going to bring the stock in about three eighths or an eighth inch minimum thicker than it needs to be and we're going to hang on to that and this allows us to run an end mill all the way the length of the part around the perimeter. Uh, we could then, you know, turn it on the side and do multi-axis stuff if we need to. And it's a really powerful process and it allows us to apply a one size fits all first operation milling process to these irregular shaped parts we often see. So the downside, we got to buy extra stock uh, on small parts, aluminum, the cost difference is not a big deal and we'll gladly accept it in order to have a more streamlined milling process. Uh, when you get into exotic materials that are thicker, not only is that material more expensive per pound, but the stock increments start taking very big steps. So in aluminum, you can oftentimes in smaller thicknesses find eighth inch increments. Uh, once you get past one inch, it might start moving in quarter inch increments. Tool steels, um, you're going to start seeing like half inch increments past one inch and you get past two inch, it's going to probably start being one inch increments in thickness. So the stock you're buying is way more expensive per pound and you're buying a lot more of it just to hang on to and then mill away later. But we, we still accept this because the process is so powerful. Um, Having that in mind, though, how can you as a designer tweak your part design to avoid having to pay for extra stock that we're going to get rid of later? Uh, and the, the trick there is don't design to nominal dimensions if you don't have to. Uh, try to stay about a grip stock increment below. So um, let's look at this classic part here. This is uh, perfect example of a grip stock part. You got some serrated knife jaws. The material is about an eighth inch thicker on all sides. It allows us to really bite into the material, run an end mill all around it. We can flip it on its side, put these holes in. Just a great way to make a part. Now let's look at a less pleasing example. We have this big thing. It is five inches wide, two inches thick. Uh, and let's say it's stainless. That's probably gonna be, if it were that exact size, probably in that length, gonna be like a $400 block of uh, you know some exotic flavor of stainless. 
if we have to go up to two and a half just to hang on to it, that's now like a $500 block. That's $100 in grip stock. Also keep in mind, uh, a lot of job shop quoting on material, uh, it doesn't make sense to bring in a really expensive piece of material and put like an hour of labor on it and then bill them material cost plus one hour. The cash flow issues that arise from that uh, are not good for the business. So a lot of job shops, if it's common work, there's not a lot of risk, it's material cost times anywhere from three to five times the material cost. So that hundred dollars of grip stock could really be like three to five hundred dollars in grip stock. Uh, so it really starts to add up. So uh, avoiding grip stocks really, if at all doable, helpful. And on this part, for example, let's you know it's an Autodesk example, but let's say it's like a servo mount or something. The bore is locating it, and the height is already set with this face. So these wings that are creating the two inch height, do they really need to be two inches tall? What if we brought them down an eighth an inch? Now all of a sudden we can use two inch stock. We can save $100 minimum per part and material. Um, that's pretty powerful. Uh, so keep that in mind. Avoiding nominal dimensions keeps you from jumping up an increment in price. Um, <laughs> And if you're unsure where those breaks in uh, material might happen, there's a lot of online material vendors that you can kind of familiar, familiarize yourself with, like what sizes and inventories they keep. Um, if you ask a machinist to make up a quick bracket or something, the very first thing he's probably going to do is walk over to the saw rack and see what he has in hand. Um, and so to know what your steel vendors that your machinist are using have in hand can can really help inform your design process. Uh, so another subject is um, availability. Uh, if you need something in a hurry, sometimes materials over two inch, the the common next day suppliers, that's where they stop is about the two inch mark. So um, you know, if you need something in a hurry, make sure it can be got next day. Um, pop on McMaster or Online Metals or any of the any of those types of suppliers and and uh, figure out what material you're going to design around. Okay, so now let's say this notes for the machinist, um, the boss's son-in-law who's never ran a machine buys all the material, and he got you a block that's the exact size of the CAD model and you got to figure out how to hang on to it and make a good part. So, uh, sometimes the uh, grip stock is in the part and it's hiding, you got to find it. So, if we, if we look at our part, we have this big hollow area here. What could we do with it? Maybe mill two slots and then grip on the little island that those slots form. And all of a sudden, we can process the part holding it like this, and then flip it over and put that slot in and finish it that way. Not the best way, but, you know, it gets the job done, and sometimes you got to do stuff like that. Uh, I see that occasionally, like on this copper part, it was right to nominal size, so I, uh, I gripped where there is no stock here and did my first stop and then flipped it and then hauled out all that. Um, not my preference. I try to. I like doing it this way because I get all the material off and let it stress relieve before I start finishing. But um, you know, you do have options like that. I forgot to mention. Sometimes a good way to use material right to the thickness you modeled and avoid grip stock is to just have a big chamfer or a fillet, if you dare. But that allows you to grip on this area, keep your end mill above the jaws. And then when you flip for the next operation, you just cut that chamfer on and uh, you have your fully contoured part and you didn't have to buy any grip stock. Okay, so that's when we want grip stock. There are a few occasions when we would prefer the model be right to a nominal stock increment. Uh, for me, a classic example is any kind of guide rail 
and I see a lot of that in my line of work, uh, especially on like conveyors and dies. You have a lot of just strips of metal that are guiding something. And the way we make that is we buy in pre-ground material. It is ground on thickness and width to plus or minus a thou. It has very good parallelism and usually a flatness tolerance of like one thou per foot. So it's a pretty good way to build decently precise things without having to do much work. Um, as long as it is that thickness and that width that the vendor can provide. So like this, for example, it's 3 16 wide or 3 16 inch thick and one inch wide. And the setup for machining that looks like this. Um, what is this? Uh, we'd have maybe two vices, maybe it's on a fixture plate, but all we have to do is saw cut it a little long. We come in, trim the ends to length, and pop in two holes. And that thing's done. That is a really quick setup. So back to this. Let's say though it wasn't designed to nominal. Like you had your conveyor, you configured on the supplier's website, you had this little support block from another design you drug in, and then you looked at it, you knew where the part needs to be, you knew where the edge of the support block is, and the distance between that was one inch and 35 thou, so that's how wide you made your, your guide rail here. It's one inch, 35 thou wide. And on top of that, you're, you're the prestigious North American plant of a German automobile supplier and all your toolings and metric. So you're going to make the thickness of this rail a nominal metric five millimeters. But all the material I could buy is quarter inch or three sixteenths. So to make this part, I have to machine from quarter inch down to five millimeters, 53 thou, and I have to take 215 thou off the side. So all of a sudden, that sub one minute cycle time of trimming the ends and poking two holes kind of becomes a, an issue. Um, machining thicknesses on long slender parts like this is not trivial. Um, and so if, if we could do something to avoid it, like moving the bracket over and cat a little and going back to a one inch nominal thickness or width in a nominal thickness, we save a lot of frustration. So, my goal in making this video was not for you to know every time when we're going to use grip stock and when we want the part right to nominal, but rather to give you a little better understanding of when we give you that feedback, what it is we mean by that and why we mean that. So um, I would say most of the time grip stock is the norm and stain a little bit under nominal on width and about an eighth inch minimum, maybe a quarter inch minimum under those price jumps uh, uh, for thickness, that can, that can really amount to a lot of money and savings for you on your, your projects. So um, keep that in mind. And then anytime it's something that's thin, like if it looks like you could bend it, we're probably going to want to process it from material that's already on thickness. So any kind of sheet goods, uh, any kind of rail, um, just so keep that in mind. That's not always the case, but um, hopefully you can develop some understanding by that. So uh, I do appreciate you watching. Um, some of the early feedback I got on the last video was don't go esoteric with it. Stick to common stuff. So I think the next one's going to be on holes and fasteners. Um, I think there's some, some savings and frustration to be saved uh, if there were a little better cross the aisle understanding between machinists and designers there. Um, so uh, this was kind of a tricky one to communicate. Uh, I hope I did well and thank you for watching.